Hi friends, my name is Mackenzie, also known as M to the Third, and this is the M to the Third Knitting Channel. Um, so normally I do a knitting podcast, which is sit down and go through all of the things that I'm working on. That's about monthly, but I wanted to start incorporating a little more like chill video. <laughs> Um, and I have a bunch of questions that people ask me through Instagram during Vlogmas that I never got around to answering during then. So I thought I'd hang out and work on um, a project. I'm currently working on this big old crochet blanket. Um, I did a couple of rows yesterday and I'm just feeling, feeling it, working on it and probably just gonna keep doing that. And I thought I would chat with you while I work on it um, and answer some of those questions. So thanks for hanging out and uh, let's get started. <laughs> the first question I'm reading says, any knits you're dreading slash abandoning slash avoiding? And I read it as anything and I was like, whoa. <laughs> talk about asking me to be vulnerable um but let's talk about that in terms of knits um maybe I shouldn't rest that against my tripod so because of the new year a lot of people um you know I I like to watch knitting podcasts as well and I think there's a theme right now happening where a lot of people are like looking at their whips and just kind of taking like assessing, I guess, what they have to work on. And um, that's absolutely the reason I pulled out this. This, these are, this is a blanket that I started during Vlogmas 2020. Yeah. And uh, um, every once in a while I'll pick it up and like do a little section, but I haven't really had the desire to work on it fully. I do have a couple other crochet scrap blankets and those both took me about a year each um, to, to finish, of course, working on them on and off. So um, looking at everyone kind of assessing their whips um, encouraged me to pull this one out. Also, I cannot crochet without looking, so apologies if my eye contact isn't as good as it usually is while I'm working on this. Yeah, I did assess all of my whips. This is the one that kind of was speaking to me, especially because I realized that I'm more than halfway done with it. And um, it does take me a while to do a couple rows, but it doesn't take me as long as I thought it did. So I figure if I take this to, um, I help host a weekly knit night here in Portland, Oregon. And so I figure if I take this instead of any other project for a couple of weeks, I'm gonna make some like pretty good headway on it. Um, so I worked on it yesterday, I'm working on it right now, and uh, we'll see how far along I get. Um, I'm definitely a, project finisher. So having things that are whips kind of like looms on me, but I actually have a couple of sweaters that are like knit to here that I need to just knit the body on and it's like, come on, just get it together. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have two sweaters like that that I need to try on and kind of assess because I feel like I realized I'd I realized I needed to do some shaping on them and so I just like left them. So I definitely want to sort of take an assessment of where those are at and work on those. That's two. Um, I also have a sweater that I started for my niece in October that I, I'm almost finished on the body on and then just have to knit the sleeves. I need to just, so I need to just do that. And then I have a sweater that I started before Vlogmas that I knew I wasn't gonna make a lot of headway on, but I really wanted to cast it on. So that's like on hold kind of indefinitely for now. I know I'll get to it at some point. It's just on hold for the moment. Um, let's see what else. I have a mitten that I have to knit. I've knit one of them. Um, but of all these whips, none of them I'm dreading, necessarily. I just, they're set aside, 
And like my Stockbridge cardigan, if you saw sort of the saga about that, um, I will, I know myself and I will either frog it or get to it eventually. Um, I'm not too, not too worried about them. So I would say right now I don't have a lot that I'm dreading. I really try to make my making joyful. And if something is not like bringing me joy, then I just frog it usually, save the yarn. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what's, what is going on with those whips. In terms of life and things that I'm dreading though, <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to save that for <laughs> another time. Oh, I got favorite scary movie of the year. Um, of course this was meant for last year. Um, there are a lot of really great horror movies coming out recently and um, there were a lot that Kay and I went to see in theaters last year. Um, there is an amazing little theater in Portland called Studio One and one of my coworkers recommended it to me and they it's kind of like you know I don't know if, if you've ever been to an Alamo draft house um, they bring you food while you're eating, but each theater is actually pretty small and you reserve your seat beforehand and there's like couches. So if you're like on a date, it's cute. You can kind of get cuddly. Um, and so Kay and I, there were two movies that we really wanted to see. Um, one was Bodies, 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 and the other was Nope. Um, and so we actually were like, you know what, let's do a double feature. It was really hot, it was summer, um, and being in an air-conditioned theater sounded amazing. So we did two on a Sunday morning, um, back to back, and it was like perfect. It was, um, very cheap because Sunday morning shows are not as expensive as like a Saturday or Friday night, and, um, we just like had a great time. They do this thing called honey dust popcorn and it's like reminiscent of kettle corn, but I would say a little less sweet. And um, yeah, we were kind of just like assessing it. So we didn't, we weren't totally sure if we were gonna order things, but um, yeah, it's a really, really awesome local theater to us and we were like that. Um, so we started doing that this year, which is definitely the first time we've been back in the theaters since 2020. Um, and we saw those two movies as well as Barbarian, which is probably my favorite horror movie from last year. It was super fun. We also saw Pearl, um, which I also really, really enjoyed. And then we watched a ton at home, like X and... The Witch, yeah. So I think my favorite one, just for entertainment value and like the watch experience is Barbarian. If you haven't seen it yet, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's, even if you're like not into horror movies, I don't feel like it was so intense and scary and there's enough comedy in it. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still dark themes, but there was enough comedy in it to not make it like terrifying. Um, yeah, so I really liked that one. I also recently watched um, a movie through, I ha so I have a Slack channel and during the month of October, because I'm really into horror, I invited people to watch via Netflix party um, a couple movies with me. The first one we watched is Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark which was really fun. And the second one was The Wretched. And I watched it, it was a weekend that Kay was out of town. Um, and so Kay didn't watch it with me and I recently was like, I really want you to see this because I've been thinking about it a lot. Even though initially I was like, the acting is like, eh. I really enjoyed the story. It's very folk horror, which is one of my favorite genres. And I actually recently read a book that I think is why I was thinking about the movie so much because they were kind of like reminiscent of each other. Um, that one's on Netflix and was a really, I just really enjoyed it. If you're into like witchy forest vibes, then um, I would recommend it. It's got a good twist. It is scary, but 
well, I don't know, maybe my horror scare bar is not a good, <laughs> is not a good um, thing to reference if you are not into horror at all, but I really like that movie. So I would say my favorite of this year or of 2022 was Barbarian just for the entertainment value. Um, and I would recommend you see it. I feel like I got asked this question, but I didn't go into detail and people have been, were commenting that they wanted to hear more. So um, someone asked, what's your favorite thing to listen to and watch while podcast, or sorry, while podcasting, while making knitting? Um, and I said, I mean, I listen and watch a lot of stuff. It's been really nice to have horror movies to watch recently. So Kay and I, I mean, I've talked about this quite a bit. We got really into them and sort of being nerdy about it during the pandemic because it was very much a like, well, it's bad out there, but it's not like this bad. Like there's not a paranormal thing haunting us. There's not zombies literally chasing us down the street. Um, and so, we got really into it and then we started kind of like looking more at like film history and um, especially the fact that horror, and I think, I mean, there's so many theories and whatever, but it's a very tied to queerness. And I think it's just because it's like not of the normative, um, you know, it's narrative, whatever. Um, so I think because it's like not normative, it attracts a lot of people who also feel not normative. Um, so there's like a lot of queerness involved in the making of a lot of these movies, in the storytelling of a lot of these movies, and have been queer coded or even co-opted by queers. And so that's definitely part of like the interest of for for me and for Kay and there's a great um series on Shudder this is not sponsored <laughs> even though I would love for Shudder to sponsor me um but Shudder is a horror movie streaming platform and they do have original movies and series both that are um like original and are like documentary style and there's an amazing series um called queer for fear and they interview a lot of queer actors and directors and writers about um classic horror monsters classic horror tropes classic movies um and then like and just kind of talk about how queer they are. <laughs> you know, like Mary Shelley was very queer and um, like a lot, and like Oscar Wilde wrote like a lot of kind of like horror adjacent content that, um, you know, and he was queer and they talk about how his, how the way that he was persecuted influenced other queer writers of his time. Um, and I thought, it was just, it's a great series. I really enjoyed it. Um, we also really enjoy the Wussy Movie podcast where they talk about horror quite a bit. And then, so yeah, I, I like, I guess what I'm trying to say is I read and watch and listen to a lot of queer horror adjacent things um, and have a lot of fun, fun doing that. Um, we have a poster like a scratch off poster that has a hundred horror movies on it and each line of the poster kind of starts um early like in terms of time like in the early 1900s even um and then it gets more and more contemporary and so we've been making our way through that list because in theory it's like holds all of the horror classics um, but we find that we do enjoy the more contemporary um, horror because I think there's more conversation about like politics in it. Um, and I, I, I don't necessarily feel that I prefer like intellectual horror, <laughs> but I think they just feel very relevant, especially post like Get Out. And just using horror as a way to describe 
experiences that we all share. Um, that being said, one of the movies that is on there that we hadn't watched for like the most recent contemporary was The Invisible Man, which is the recent one starring Elizabeth Moss. And you guys, I turned it off halfway through. I mean, part of it, I, I felt like it was not nuanced enough. It was too on the nose. Um, I mean, the story is essentially she leaves an abusive relationship and it's like two for like wondering if she has mental health issues or if her husband is actually like from the dead coming back to torment her and I was just like I was just like I don't need to watch this like I, I don't know I just really I was sort of like I didn't have any patience for it and it wasn't I don't know I just didn't I just truly didn't like it. Yeah, that's one thing. The other thing that I do is I read and knit at the same time. I cannot read and crochet at the same time because I have to look at what I'm crocheting. But um, especially when I'm doing long stretches of stockinette, I love to read um, and knit. So I will usually put my Kindle on a little stand or I'll even pull up the Kindle app on my computer and sit in front of my computer. That's just the easiest way. Um, I have read like physical books I have like a little I'll try and find it but I have like a little I don't even know like a tool I guess that helps keep the pages open when the book is open but it's a pain because you have to turn the page um and it's just it's a little easier to use my kindle or my ipad or my computer to pull up the Kindle app and then it syncs them all across all the devices. So one of my favorite things to read is Knit Lit, <laughs> um, which is pretty, pretty funny. Um, so I have a few favorite Knit Lit series and I have a few Knit Lit books that I like fully hated. <laughs> So, I mean, the they're of the cozy mystery genre, so if you have read cozy mysteries before, um, what you have to know about them is that they are very easy reads, they're very full of, they're full of tropes, and you know, that's, o that's okay, right? Um, I kind of refer to them, and this is absolutely not to I just I don't want this to see as me putting a negative connotation on them because I thoroughly enjoy these books I read a lot of them they give me a lot of entertainment and joy and they're not like high literature and that's okay right like I like reality tv as much as I like a serious drama and that doesn't make one better or worse than the other okay um so, like, I'm just saying if you enjoy these books or if you're, like, turning your nose up, like, both, like, it's fine. Just do what you like. I really enjoy reading them, and, and I'm good with that. <laughs> like, they are my reality TV. Um, or even, like, my CSI. Whatever you want to say. My Law & Order. Um, but they have knitting in them, so it, they're better than Law & Order, you know? <laughs> this was the first series I read. Um, it, you would really like it if you like Gilmore Girls. It's a group of, you know, 20 something year old friends. But the caveat to like almost all of these is that even if the main character is in their 20s, these are written by women, almost primary, I think primarily women who are like in their 50s and 60s. So even though you're like, oh, I'm reading about someone in their 20s, I'm in my 30s, like, cool, let's vibe. It, like, doesn't feel like it. You're like, these are, like, 60-year-old, 20-year-olds. Um, there's a lot of, like, oh, my God, I love coffee. I need all this coffee, which is very, like, Gilmore Girls. And also, the dialogue is not very, um, not, it doesn't flow well. Like, it's, like, people, because there's so many characters, I think this is why, because there's, like, eight friends in the main friend group, and then there's, like, maybe th four sort of, like, 
older friends who like are always kind of also involved and then there's like some kids that get involved um and then of course there's like the characters who end up being murdered and whatever and the dialogue it just does not flow because they're always saying each other's names to try and clarify who they're talking to and who is speaking. Um, it's just not the most well written. And like the last one that I read, I think was like maybe number 12. And I think there's maybe 16 total, some something like that. Don't, <laughs> don't mark me. Um, but I would, I put it down out of frustration and came back to it and finished it. And it was just, like, so out of touch. It was, like, uh, the story of a student who was assaulted by a professor who was much older than her. And they were like, well, she lied to ruin his career. And I was like, you know what? I just, I couldn't deal. Like, I did read most of them and enjoy them. But um, they're not perfect by any means. Um, the second book series that I want to talk about is The Seaside Knitters. Um, that is by Sally Golden Goldenbaum, and I listened to most of those on audiobook, and I really enjoy that series. Part of what was fun about it is that it takes place in um, Cape Ann, which is off the coast of Massachusetts, and so of course I was living in Massachusetts at the time, and it was really fun to like hear about different landmarks, and then to like be able to like see them. <laughs> I even went to Cape Ann for like a camping trip and when I was like getting off the freeway and stuff it was so clear that the author was a local because street names were named out like she had named families in the series after like the street names um like the common streets. So that one was really fun to read. It kind of made me want to live in a little seaside town. The characters feel more real and genuine, I think, than the Maggie Sefton books. And um, frequently, I, I mean, when I'm reading these, I really suspend my disbelief, like in trying to figure out who did what, right? Because they're, they're pretty formulaic. But I, found myself surprised a couple of times while reading the Sally Golden Mom series. Um, and they're still coming out. Like, I think one just came out that's been on my holds list. So, yeah, those ones are, I, I really enjoy. So the third series in the cozy mystery section is the Vampire Knitting Club series. Now, these ones are hella goofy, <laughs> okay? Like, for real. Um, but that has not stopped me from listening to about 12 of them. So um, these ones are about an American whose grandma passes away and she shows up at the yarn store, which has been left to her, um, to find that her grandma is still there, but has become a vampire and has been turned into a vampire um, by the group of vampires who live under the store. And she finds out that she's also a witch. <laughs> um, and then there's a murder in every book. So it's as absurd as it seems and very entertaining. Um, again, a like 20 year old woman written by someone who is much older and is you're like, this is just not this is not how a 20 year old would act, in my opinion. And also the audiobook narrator, you can tell is older. And it just doesn't quite like match the vibe. Um, but it's entertaining. And there's a point when she is like, you know, debating between two suitors, if you will. Um, and one is a cop and one is a vampire. And I was like, Miss Ma'am, please get it together. Like, a cab in this shit. Um, I will hold back what happens. I will say no more. Um, so that one's a really great one. Um, I mean, it's goofy. It's like, I would say the best written ones out of all of these are probably the Sally, Sally Goldenbaum one. But I want to talk about a fourth one that I'm actually reading right now. I'm on the fourth book and I've been really enjoying it. 
Um, it is a series by Reagan Davis that's available on Kindle Unlimited that is a notorious <laughs> murder mystery. Um, and I, I've been very much enjoying it. So a lot of these books, um, are just like extremely heteronormative, extremely white, and it's a little like, and this one, at least the, her best friend is queer. And I was like, oh, thank God, there's a queer in here, like, and a lot of the restaurant names are like hilarious puns that I'm just like, what the fuck? Um, the, the friend, the queer friend and her wife own a like, bakery called artsy tartsy tart artsy tartsy which is ridiculous there's like a mexican restaurant that they mention called stop guac and roll it's like out of control um and it just like all the characters feel more real the writing flows a lot better um the dynamic between her and of course the cop who she's interested in um is actually like good <laughs> and believable. Um, yeah, I, I've been really enjoying the series. I'm only on book four, but I usually don't know what's going on. Like, I can't immediately pick out who killed who and whatnot, so I've been really enjoying that. Um, yeah. So I'll post links to all of these down below um, if you're interested in them. I mean, Knitlet is a really fun genre, in my opinion. Um, you know, especially just because if you're gonna read, like, a mystery, why not read a knitting mystery? Oh, some honorable mentions for other knit lit where I've only read, like, maybe the first one are, um, On Skein of Death, which is a riverbank knitting mystery. Um, when I haven't read more than one of them, then usually it's because I didn't fully enjoy, like I, it just wasn't, I was fine with just reading one. So I do want to mention some other knit lit books that are not murder <laughs> related, um, that are just knit, knitting adjacent books. Um, the probably most popular one is called The Friday Night Knitting Club by Kate Jacobs. Um, this came out at like the peak of like knitting resurgence in the early 2000s. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but I was really mad at the end. And if you know, you know. But, um, yeah, just, like, make sure you have a box of Kleenex with you. Um, and then the other one is The Knitting Circle by Anne Hood. Kind of, like, similar vibes, just, like, storytelling about these characters. It's very character-focused literature. They're all, like, fine, you know. Um, and then there's the Cypress Hollow Yarn series, which are romance books by Rachel Heron. And, woo, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I remember listening to these and it was pro it was like my first introduction to romance because I was just like on a knit lit kick. And so I downloaded one, um, because Rachel Heron actually used to live was like a patron of my, the local yarn store I worked at in Oakland. And so I knew of her and I was like, oh, I'll like give it a shot. And I was like, that's not what I thought it was. And I was like listening to it at work. Um, that was pretty funny. So those are actually, I really enjoy them. I would recommend them. Um, and she's also written a couple thrillers that are really good too. So Rachel Heron, um, and I, God, there is one that I read, it must have not transferred onto here, that was by Debbie McComber. Um, don't read that book. <laughs> Whatever that knitting book is, don't read it. It was trash. It was fat shaming, full of like women hate. Uh, it was awful. I did read the whole thing and finish it, but I cannot in good faith recommend that book to anyone. Um, so don't read any Debbie McComber. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's like a pretty big list of knit lit. I hope that you find something in there that appeals to you. I do think they're really fun. It's kind of like a whole cozy mysteries are really 
are fun and also like I would love more diversity in them and more queerness and uh, I have definitely had thoughts about knitting my own knit lit cozy mystery series but um, you know just file that away for like <laughs> one day um, other like I know I I don't usually talk about books but um, I don't know, maybe people are interested in that. I The book that I was talking about that's related to the folk horror um, was a book that I just read called Slewfoot. It's by Brom, and um, it takes place in, like, the 1600s in Puritanical, uh, I think they're in Connecticut, and um, I really... I've been thinking about it a lot since I finished it and I just really like the way that it was nuanced about God and the devil and good and bad and evil and um yeah I really really enjoyed it um the storytelling was really brilliant the just themes in it I really enjoyed um, if you enjoyed Midnight Mass, which is a series on Netflix, if you enjoyed The Witch, um, with Anya Taylor-Joy, um, or if you enjoyed The Wretched, that movie that I watched, I would highly recommend Slewfoot. Um, yeah, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I couldn't put it down. Um, so yeah, horror kind of makes its way also into some of the stuff that I read, as well as just romance, fluffy, fun romance novels. Um, yeah, that's kind of what are my favorite things to listen and read. And then of course knitting podcasts. I watch a lot of knitting podcasts because I like to know what's going on, I like hanging out with knitters, and um, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi. Oh, you so cut out. I'm making bread. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, minor bread assistance for my little sister. Okay. Um, next I have asked, what is the rose and thorn of podcasting? <sighs> um, I mean, okay. I really love having a podcast channel. I like how it's allowed me to meet people through this format, get people to know me. Um, if you don't know, I have a Slack channel and I adore it, like having it, all the people in it, um, what we've been able to do. It's like provided me a lot of opportunities. Um, so of course I don't think I would keep doing it if it didn't bring me joy. Um, but there's a lot of <laughs> thorns. I think right now they've been very much on my mind. Thorns are that you can put a lot of work into this and still not get much payout or views. And that's kind of like something that I've been coming up against lately. Um, yeah, it's just frustrating to see people like posting a first video and getting like tens of thousands of views and immediately having enough subscribers to do the things that I have been like just trying to do for years. Um, I try not to get like bitter about it, but sometimes it's hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just, I think that's what happens when you exist in the world as a fat, queer, woman. Um, you know, I'm very white passing, but I'm also Latina and yeah, it's just, it feels like a very intentional snubbing sometimes. So that's kind of one of the thorns is that all of those things about yourself feel very put on display and the reason that maybe you aren't as successful as some other people. So, yeah. Anyway, try not to dwell on it and still do what, what I want. 
Um, someone asked, okay, so we're moving into like knitting, knitting territory. Um, someone asked what fiber art would you like to learn more about and dive into? Um, there's a couple, uh, one is punch needling or like rug tufting. Um, I've kind of delved into it, but I think that that would be really fun, especially because I'm also an illustrator to turn some of my art or sayings or whatever into like a rug or wall hanging, I think would be super sick. Um, so at some point I'll do that. It's not, it's just like on my ever growing list. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool. I'm excited that it's like having a moment right now. <laughs> um, and also in the realm of knitting, I would really like to do more designing. And I've already kind of started the year doing some of that. So um, I'll talk more about that in the next podcast episode. But I mean, I would, of course, like basically everything I would love to do at some point. So like weaving, um, even some macrame maybe. But um, I also find that even when I have my sewing out and I'm like working on my sewing. Oh, it's come back to knitting. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question is favorite yarns. I mean, there's definitely some yarns that I always come back to, even though they might not feel as, I don't know, maybe exciting as maybe what people were wanting to know. But, um, one of those yarns is Malabrigo Rios. I know that's like basic bitch energy for sure, but I like it because um, it's great for gift knitting and for kiddos because it's super wash, it's very soft, and the colors are really fun. Um, in line with that, um, Manos del Uruguay's, not Rios, it's a uh, Alegria Grande is also very comparable, but it actually has some nylon content in it, which makes it even more durable than Rios, because Rios does have um, the tendency to pill. Um, so both of those are definitely up there. I also really love Woolstock from Blue, Fi Blue Sky Fibers. Um, it's a 100% wool not breed specific. Um, it's like a loose two ply. It's very soft and um, comes in a really great range of colors and it's a good price point. I really love Peace Fleece, which they haven't, I think they're having issues with getting it dyed or something. So there's very low to no stock of it right now, which is really a bummer. It's a great yarn. One of my sweaters, even though it's like a little clunk, my knitting, clarify, was a little clunky. It was like a pieced sweater. But in terms of like temperature regulation, I find that that's one of the best sweaters um, that I've ever made. And I think the yarn has to do with that. Um, yeah, it's really, really lovely to wear. Um, so I love Peace Fleece. Um, I really love any BFL nylon sock base. I found that those wear for me very well. Um, one of my favorite dyers is Urso Yarn Co, which is based out of um, Quebec. And they just have really beautiful muted colors on that base that I really enjoy. Um, I really love Mondim by Retrosaria, but not for socks. Um, it's just a worsted, worsted spun sock yarn from Portuguese wool. I really like the colors. I like the marketing, like the label on it. That's a good one. And let's see, I'm trying to think of yarns that I always want to, you know, like if I'm starting a sweater, that's where I'll look first. Um, so yeah, I hope that's like a good list. I'll link them all below so you can take a look at them yourself. I also have who is your favorite designer or top 10. Um, I've been feeling a little disenchanted by <laughs> designers lately. 
Um, I really love the knitting book Knits About Winter by Emily Foden. Um, everything I've knit from there, which is a few things, um, I've really enjoyed. Um, I think they're like simple enough, but it really focuses on the different colors of yarn. Um, I love that. I also really love Isolde's shaping and everything about Isolde's patterns. I've knit a lot of her designs over the years and really enjoy them. I really love Lydia of Lydia Morrow, her designs, although I have not knit any of them. Um, Marie Wallen and all that color work magic. There's a Marie Wallen sweater that has been in my queue for almost 10 years, <laughs> but it's like, it wasn't in my size then, and it's definitely not in my size now, so I kind of let that, but those are like the kind of sweaters that I like dream about on a daily basis. Um, let me see if anyone else comes to the top of my head while I'm crocheting. Um, I also have some friends who are really talented designers. Uh, Lindsay Fowler of Larkspur Knits. Um, I love all her stuff that I've knit. Um, yeah, that's a great. My friend Natalie Bullock, um, who I work with here, has some amazing patterns out. Um, um, Carol Chan is also a local designer whose stuff is beautiful. I haven't knit any of her designs, but we have a lot of samples in her shop and a lot of her designs are in my queue. Um, I feel like that's a good, good little list that kind of encompasses a lot of things. Um, I don't really knit sock patterns, so there's not really sock designers on there. Um, but I do have a Coop Knits book that I really enjoy um, and have kind of made my way through a lot of those designs. <sighs> yeah, I feel like that's a pretty good list. I'll, again, try to post links to everything that I've talked about down below so that you can take a look. Um, I am almost done with this row. Thank you for helping me get through a couple of rows of this next section and um, I am off to go spend the afternoon with my niece. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you have any other questions you'd like for me to answer, you can leave them in the comments down below and hopefully I will get to another knit in chat video soon. And yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.